honor and a pleasure to introduce Reiner Force to you tonight. And there's a little bit of a backstory. Both he and I are a kind of Kantian, and about two years ago I started pestering him with categorical imperatives to come to Boston and uh, present us some of his wonderful work. And for various reasons, he kept saying no to those categorical imperatives, turning me down, but saying he still wants to come, and so on. And so that process went on a little bit. And uh, now finally we had a date for him. And in the meantime, I had encountered a certain medical condition uh, that out of his kindness and concern for my well-being led him to uh, say, well, you know, here's the paper, um, you can read it ahead, but, you know, please, by all means, don't feel pressured to make a commentary and so on and so forth. And, and so here's the paper, but uh, don't do it, don't do the commentary. So I have obviously studiously ignored his categorical imperative. So I, I leave it to you to make what you will of two Kantians. Um, engaging and giving each other imperatives that they both respectively uh, simply ignore. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce Ryan Forrest to you. It's an honor because he is perhaps the leading political philosopher of his generation in Germany, a claim supported by the fact that he was the only political philosopher to be awarded the Leibniz Prize in 2012, a prize which is the highest award given to academic researchers in Germany, given by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, or German Research Institution. His academic pedigree makes such an achievement somewhat unsurprising, as he is the only person that I know of who spent significant amounts of time studying with both John Rawls and Jürgen Habermas, arguably the two most important social and political philosophers of the last half century. His first book, Context of Justice, Political Philosophy Beyond Liberalism and Communitarianism, was viewed by Habermas as bringing the debate between liberalism and communitarianism to a provisional close, and has been widely influential, introducing his trademark arguments concerning a fundamental right to justification, about which we'll hear a little bit more in his talk tonight. His second book, Toleration and Conflict, can, I think, justly be called what one hopes will only be a first magnum opus. It's a remarkable blend of historical narrative and critical reconstruction concerning the concept and ideal of toleration. The remaining two works, The Right to Justification, Elements of a Constructivist Theory of Human Rights, and Justification in Critique. I have a copy of it. I'll just show it to you. If anybody wants to come take a look at it after the talk, you can. Are both uh, collections uh, wide-ranging collections of uh, some of Forrest's numerous essays, which to my mind show that while he is on the one hand one of Isaiah Berlin's intellectual hedgehogs, doggedly pursuing the trail of one major idea, something like Heidegger going on for 60 years about the meaning of the being of beings, uh, so pursuing one major idea at the heart of the critically reconstructed tradition of Kantian political theory, this notion of a right to justification, he has also performed the neat trick of being, on the other hand, one of Berlin's intellectual foxes, applying his critical and, in, and imaginative acumen to an extraordinarily diverse array of topics, including the relation between the right and the good, the role of utopian thinking and political thought, the nature of autonomy and freedom, and the insights into justice that one can find in the plays of Ibsen. Finally, beyond the honor, it is a pleasure to introduce Reiner because he is a friend and inspiration whom I got to know personally during a postdoctoral fellowship at the Justitia Amplificata Center for Advanced Studies on Global Justice in Frankfurt am Main in Germany, of which he is a co-director. I learned very on during my stay there that he embodies the ancient philosophical virtue of meaning what he says, of living out the philosophy in his works as best he can. You see, my wife was pregnant when we arrived in Germany. According to the financial and legal arrangements at the center, fellows were supposed to get private insurance. But in Germany, as in up until recently in the US, private insurers were allowed to exclude pre-existing conditions. And my wife's pregnancy was obviously a pre-existing condition from the standpoint of the German insurance companies. You can imagine the fear that struck my heart at the thought of my wife having an uninsured pregnancy in a foreign country. That thought was so appalling. Uh, uh, that thought was so appalling that the only acceptable option at first seemed to be sending her home, a thought unbearable for the separation it would imply. 
Reiner never wavered or hesitated and assured me that a solution would be and had to be found because, he said, health care was a human right. And indeed, a creative solution was found. So it is a great delight to present Reiner to you tonight for what I know is a stimulating paper, and I look very much forward to the discussion that we will have. And with that, I leave the floor to Reiner. Thanks so much, uh, Jonathan, for these awfully kind words. Um, thanks also to you and to Professor Berdu for the invitation here. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I, I always wanted to come here uh, to present my thoughts and see some uh, old friends uh, like you, like David, and some others I see in the uh, in the audience. It's very good, very good to be here, um, and I'm glad it, it finally worked out. I'm also glad it is a few days after your second child was born. So congratulations again. Um, I know this is a busy time for you, and so I'm really grateful for being here. Most of all, I really hate uh, to have you made wait so long, uh, to have made you wait so long. It's, it's terrible. Um, um, Flat probably explained to you, I was in giving a talk in Binghamton, and I was supposed to fly out of Binghamton through Philadelphia today, um, and the flight was cancelled because of bad weather in Philadelphia. This country has a lot of bad weather and has a lot of flight cancellations. Noticed. It happened to me in January too, but at that time I got stranded in Puerto Rico, so it wasn't so bad. <laughs> but, um, so this time I got stranded in Binghamton, which is a little different. And, um, and so, uh, so it was, uh, it was 12.30 nearing 1 o'clock, and so I, uh, I, I asked Avis to get me the fastest car, and I uh, and that's what they did, and it drive much, I drove much faster than I was allowed to, but it was still a very long uh, trip, so you go to Albany and then Albany. And, um, anyway, so, so I'm really sorry. Um, thanks, for, thanks for waiting. Um, so um, I'm trying to get my head into the topic now. That half of it is still on the road, uh, trying not to create havoc there. Um, and I'll, I'll be speaking on transnational justice and democracy, and I'll elaborate a little more with respect to that topic, the, um, the one idea that Johnson is, is absolutely right uh, to say that I have. I, I hope it, it carries some water with respect to that, uh, to that topic. Actually, can you hear me well? I, I'm, trying, I'm moving to and back and forth with the microphone, and so I hope it's, it's okay. Justice and democracy are the two uh, most important terms in my, um, in my title seem to signal, signal attention. Usually we think of democracy as a form of political organization and government in which through participatory <coughs> procedures a legitimate political will is formed that acquires the force of law. Whereas justice appears to be a value external to this context having to do with certain outcomes, with certain results uh, that we consider as just and then we juxtapose them to what democracy has, um, has come up with. But I think we make a mistake if we, uh, uh, especially if we think about transnational justice, but about justice generally, uh, if we think of um, justice and democracy as different values in that way. Um, I think they are normatively and conceptually um, related, um, and I will try to explain this in a first step, and then show um, what this means with respect to um, transnational justice. So I'll argue against what I call three dogmas in political theory, namely the first about the conceptual incompatibility um, of democracy and justice, the second that only a state can constitute what I call a context of justice, a context in which the term justice, social and political justice, properly applies. And third, the dogma that democracy presupposes, as a practice, presupposes a demos organized within a state. Obviously, these two uh, uh, second and third dogmas um, uh, present a problem for anyone who wants to develop the theory of transnational justice, but I think once we get the relation between justice and democracy right, we can make uh, faster progress with respect to these other two dogmas. Now, justice. <coughs> I think, and I'll 
know, this is a much longer this is a much longer argument, and I'll be really sketchy about it. Um, reflection on justice, I think, is all too often shaped by an apolitical, a non-political understanding of justice, resulting from a particular interpretation of the ancient principle to each his own, which has been central to the notion of justice since Plato, and is interpreted until recent days in such a way that the primary issue is which goods individuals justly receive or deserve. In other words, who gets what, properly speaking, or justifiably. The search for answers about which goods or levels of welfare individuals uh, should um, have or receive then leads to comparisons between uh, levels of goods, um, um, welfare conditions, um, and so on between, uh, between people. Um, or uh, sufficientarians want to uh, show us a way out of the comparative uh, reflections and ask whether in what it means that individuals have enough of the necessary good for uh, human or good life, irrespective of comparisons. Now, what these views share is what I call a recipient-oriented or a goods-oriented view of justice, um, <coughs> which I think conceals uh, important aspects of justice, and therefore I think it is a um, it is a view we should overcome. Not all of these views, but quite a few of them, uh, do uh, not take into account, or at least not properly into account, how the goods that are to be distributed, health, education, uh, material goods, housing, and so on, how these goods um, arose in the first place, how they, uh, what the uh, conditions of their production are. Also, uh, secondly, the question of um, the political question of who determines uh, the structures of production as well as distribution and who has the authority to determine that is not in the foreground as if they were as if society were a, a huge distribution machine which only needed to be programmed in the right way and then things would just develop in J. A. Cohen's work for example you find the idea of a distributor um, as someone to whom you address the right metrics and um, uh, considerations um, of justice. But I think this is, a, this is an idea that's not just unrealistic, it's also an idea that uh, takes justice uh, away from being an accomplishment of those who live in a social order and turns them into recipients. Uh, of justice, and I think that is a, a major, a major problem. This also overlooks that I think we cannot read off the justifiable claims that people have in a given social order to certain goods um, or rights just from the situation in which they're in. Uh, the claims have to be made, uh, assessed, and re. Um, reflexively reformulated in a procedure of justification. They have that it has to be a constructive procedure. And Jonathan was so kind to say that I'm a Frankfurt Frankfurt Kantian, which of course means a discourse theoretical Kantian. So here's a discourse theoretical point: claims claims to to a just distribution aren't simply there, given where and who you are. They have to be um, they have to be constructed in a procedure of justification. And the standing and participation possibilities in these justification procedures, that, I will argue, is the major focus for a conception of justice. Finally, if you had a purely, and I, and I, I should stress this is a, um, uh, um, uh, a bit of a, of, of a very generalized picture, if you had a purely goods and recipient-oriented understanding of justice. You also have certain problems um, to uh, address issues of injustice. Assume someone is in a desperate situation, lacks uh, essential goods like housing and food, because he or she is uh, the victim uh, of a natural catastrophe. 
um, and of course natural catastrophes and how they hit people and what happens then is not a pure natural occurrence but assume for the sake of the argument this person has been hit by a natural catastrophe another person is the victim of uh, certain forms of exploitation of being wronged by others and is in the very same situation of lacking food and housing. If you have a purely recipient-oriented view of justice, these people are in the same situation. They lack the same things. Um, they, have this, they have similar needs. Um, something has to be done. And for a goods-oriented, for a consequentialist um, uh, thinker, uh, what needs to be done is the same thing in both cases. Uh, for someone who holds uh, a political and structural notion of justice, these people are not in the same situation. Both um, need to be helped, but uh, the person who is the victim of a catastrophe needs to be helped as a matter of, of a moral and social solidarity, whereas the person who has been wronged is the victim of injustice. And so helping him is one thing, but addressing the injustice means addressing the structural um, um, domination uh, he or she was or is suffering from. If we neglect that difference and use a language of assistance or aid and so on, generally for helping people who are poor, who are desperate, who are in need, I think we make a mistake. We exchange a grammar of justice with a grammar of benevolence. Um, and that's something we shouldn't do. If, for example, it so happens that lots of uh, international, what is called development aid, um, is given to um, regions or people or groups uh, within um, 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 economically uh, badly off um, uh, countries. And these countries are economically badly off because they suffer from asymmetrical power structures, political and economic ones. To say that we have a duty of assistance or of aid um, is blocking out the causal story, if there is one. And I come back to that about what makes these people poor and what reproduces their uh, poverty. So, for, the, for, for all of these reasons, I think it is important to um, um, gain a political understanding of justice. And I'm not arguing here for a political conception of justice next to a distributive one. My argument is, so, so that's how Iris Young, who made a similar argument, has been understood as if she was stressing political justice rather than distributive justice. But the point is, and I think that was hers too, that if you're interested in distributive justice, you cannot neglect the political question because the way goods come into the world and are distributed is the political question. It's not um, uh, uh, um, a, a question that you just need an ethical metric for um, and then um, need to program a political order in the right way. Uh, justice um, has to appeal to, has to be applied to the relations and structures persons are part of. And it is not primarily to their subjective or objective states of affairs. They are in only a relational reconstruction of um, um, the um, normatively relevant uh, structures we, um, we live under gives you an idea of what justice demands. Therefore, I argue that the first good, the most important good uh, of justice is that of power. And by that I mean the, the power you have, the justification power you have to co-determine, to influence, to contest the basic structures of political, social and economic order which you are subject to. Only if you have a certain power to question those and to co-determine those, then you are a subject of justice. If you are just a recipient of goods, about which others decide um, um, which goods and to what extent you receive them, you are not a subject of justice. You're, you're a recipient of goods. So that can be a very good thing.
if otherwise you have no such goods. But it's not something that puts you into a position of being a subject of justice. Now, you might say, okay, these are two very general understandings of justice. They're more general than conceptions of justice, but you can see that lack egalitarians, um, uh, sufficientarians, capability theorists mostly fall into the one camp, whereas Kantian theories uh, fall into uh, the other, and some Marxist and neo-Marxist ones, uh, depending on how you interpret them, uh, do too. And so someone asks, well, we've come to the question maybe where Rawls would fit in. I'd rather have him in the Kantian camp, but we can talk about, we can talk about this. Um, so someone asks, what makes one notion or picture of justice uh, more appropriate than the other? Uh, are these just two very different ways? And it's very difficult to, to say which one, which one is right. Is there a deeper meaning uh, to justice that helps us out of this rivalry between two ways to think about it? And I think there is. Um, Rawls was right when he said that uh, the contrasting concept uh, to uh, justice is that of arbitrariness. Um, but we need to interpret arbitrariness in a social form. It cannot, it cannot refer to any contingency that makes us different. It has to refer to asymmetries in social and political life, which form a kind of arbitrary rule, either because some rule over others without adequate justification or social contingencies that lead to asymmetrical social positions are accepted as unalterable or justifiable without being so. Uh, these are the asymmetries and the forms of arbitrariness that I think justice addresses. So arbitrary, arbitrariness with relevance to justice means arbitrary rule of some over others without legitimate reason, and that I call domination. The domination being being subject to a normative order that is not properly justifiable to you as free and equal um, participant, as a free and equal normative authority of that order. And secondly, there is a second more structural institutional aspect of domination, which means that in such a normative order, in such a social order, there isn't a place for raising critique and asking for justification or contesting justifications in the first place. So it's not just that the order is unjustifiable, it's also, also that it doesn't have institutions and places for uh, procedures um, of justification. So that is a notion of domination, which of course goes back to the more Habermasian understanding um, uh, of dominated discourse, uh, which Bruce Ackerman many years ago used uh, as an idea uh, in his social justice um, a book. Unfortunately, he placed uh, the uh, non-dominated discourse in a spaceship, um, but I think it's time for it to, uh, to land on Earth. Um, it is a notion of domination that I find um, more useful and more appropriate than a neo-republican one, because the neo-republican petitian notion of non-domination looks at these bases of freedom of choice that are as robustly, as Philip calls it, secured in a society. And my argument is, if that's what you're interested in, your focus should move further up to, this, to the institutions and the standing within them of justification that determine the laws, the norms, and the institutions which then determine uh, the freedom or equality that you have. So my, um, my argument is, is about being a normative authority when it comes to co-determine the order you live under. Uh, and I think that is uh, the better way to understand non-domination uh, rather than one uh, which looks at the individual space of freedom of choice that in a society um, is generated. Because what Philip is also interested in is, is the equal spaces, that is, the justifiable spaces of freedom within a society. And so I think that the proper, the proper non-domination arena is the space of justifications. And of course, as Jonathan said, uh, the basis for that is what I call the right to justification. And I uh, won't, I, I'd say, I, maybe 
few words uh, in a second about, um, about that idea. Uh, in contexts of justice, that is, contexts of a, of a social and political normative order, this claim involves the demand that no political or social relations should exist that cannot be adequately justified towards those subjected to them as free and equal participants. So, so the main idea of justice, I think, doesn't refer to the goods that you receive. Uh, it determines, uh, it, it is about who determines which goods you receive and which goods are brought forth in a society um, in, what, uh, in what way. So the, the major um, person uh, of justice, the subject of justice, is not the person um, who um, um, requires certain goods, but uh, the person who needs to have a standing in the social basic structure um, in which goods or rights are relevant. And injustice doesn't mean that you lack something, rather it means that you have no standing in the social order um, in which you are, uh, you are subject to. So in a normative order, in a, an order of institutions and norms binding upon you, there is a supreme principle, which I call the principle of general and reciprocal justification, which is a recursively reconstructed Habermasian slash Olivian slash Rawlsian principle uh, that uh, is that applies to all norms which claim to be reciprocally and generally valid in a social order. Therefore, we reconstruct from the validity claim the criteria of justification. That is why the first question of justice is the question of justification, normatively speaking. But if it is the question of justification, materially speaking, the first question of justice is the question of power namely the kind of justificatory power that those who are subject to a normative order have to co-determine that, um, that order in all its basic uh, uh, and relevant um, um, aspects of the production and allocation of goods, um, of um, defining rights, uh, allocating uh, rights, reinterpreting um, rights. So the central places of justice are the places where the justifications for a social basic order are generated um, and are exchanged and attain a normatively binding, um, binding force. So from here, and I won't go into that much, uh, a conception of justice would have to be developed on the basis of that principle of justification, the question of what it means to realize, to uh, politically and socially materialize a basic structure in which those subjected have sufficient justificatory power to determine um, the common frame of life in a mutually justifiable way. So that's the basic idea. And then what I call fundamental justice is the idea of what I call a basic structure of justification. That is a substantive notion of procedural justice. Substantive because it refers to all the rights and resources and capabilities that persons as subject of a normative order ought to have, to have sufficient justificatory power such that the justifications that are offered to them are not from the start reproducing the power structures that already exist in that society. So it's a typical critical theory principle. If you're interested in justifying a normative order, you need to do it under conditions which do not from the start reproduce the powers that be. And so fundamental justice is not an innocent and weak procedural notion. Uh, it, it contains a lot of um, substantive rights and possibilities. But on that basis then, there, have, there has to be a, a theory of discursive justice to um, uh, further determine the social institutions of education, health, um, uh, political uh, self-government, and so on in a society. Once this is done under conditions of non-domination secured by fundamental justice, 
people can still disagree about the kind of educational system that is to be set up, but it cannot be an educational system which subverts the possibilities of being a normative authority with sufficient justificatory power. So there's a recursive argument that always goes back to the substantive preconditions, but then there is um, a uh, discursive construction of what I call a fully just or a fully justified basic structure of society going on. Now, assume this were a plausible argument and we had defined justice in that way and had worked out a notion of discursive justice on that basis. How does democracy appear here? Well, democracy doesn't appear as a different value uh, in that scheme. Democracy is just uh, the practice of justification um, that is relevant for determining a social order um, and a normative order uh, in a justifiable, proper way. And in that sense, democracy is the main political means to banish arbitrary rule of few over many, or many over few, without good reasons. Um, I think that is traditionally how the idea of democracy was born. It wasn't born as a separate value. Uh, and, uh, of equality of freedom. It is, it, is the, it is the practice of attaining equality and freedom uh, and a proper social structure in the right way, um, in a mutually justifiable way. And so democracy understood in that way is um, the practice of political, of political justice. It is the practice of politically autonomous um, citizens and this basic claim to autonomy, uh, the claim not to be subjected to a social order that is not justifiable to you, obviously, is a Kantian autonomy idea, um, and that is the basic um, um, idea of the right to justification in political contexts. Now, so far, I I, I use the Rawlsian terminology of a basic structure, even though I redefined it as a structure of justification. You could have heard me making an argument about uh, a, a certain society which has an institutional uh, framework. How do we apply this to transnational contexts there? And I want to present some thoughts um, uh, about, um, about this. Um, um, and I begin with locating, with, with locating justice um, first. Locating justice is in recent discussions of, uh, between various approaches uh, and perceptions uh, to justice, um, um, especially with respect to, um, to global justice, um, a hot issue. Um, and there are a number of proposals on the table. The Rawlsian proposal was, and still is, that a context of justice has to be a context of cooperation, of social cooperation, um, where um, uh, there is a sufficiently tight uh, network um, of institutions, of mutual expectations, and of a shared understanding of the duties of justice that, um, that apply to it. Outside of such tighter contexts of cooperation, which Rawls thinks you can only locate in a society and what he calls a society. Uh, outside of it, um, um, cooperation is much weaker. Uh, here you have what he called duties of assistance, but not uh, all the resources, material as well as institutional and normative, to uh, speak of um, um, a context of justice, so the well-ordered society can only be attained in a tight network of cooperation. Some communitarians give this a communitarian reading about common sentiments or shared understandings required for a context of justice. Others, like Thomas Nagel, give it a more institutional twist and argue that it's not so much cooperation required for a context of justice, but legal authority, state legal authority, um, as what he calls a strong political relation. There has to be um, a collectively authorized source of law um, which applies to you uh, and, 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 and forces uh, the law on you um, 
And so since it does that, um, duties of justice and justification arise in such a legal and political framework. Now, these arguments um, of a more cooperate, cooperation-centered or more state-centered location of a context of justice have, of course, uh, an important, uh, carry an important weight. We do think that a context of justice is, of social justice especially, is a context uh, of a certain institutional, institutional structure. However, I think these arguments do employ a conclusion as a premise when they argue that a particular institutional context of cooperation or of legal force is a necessary precondition of justice. Because as I, in, in my understanding, justice is a man-made goddess who comes into the world to banish social arbitrariness or domination. And this means that justice has her place where arbitrariness and domination prevail, or the risk of arbitrariness in a given context of rule of some over others is present. But then justice cannot presuppose that institutions um, that prevent arbitrary uh, rule or domination are already in place. She does presuppose that human beings have a right to justification and she calls, justice calls, for the creation of a basic structure of justification where arbitrary rule prevails. But her calling for such institutions is not dependent on them already existing. Uh, it depends on certain relations of domination being there. But these can be institutional or non-institutional. They can be what used to be called the state of nature. Now that state doesn't exist, but there are many relations of domination outside and beyond the state or across states which uh, are properly called domination and there are many contexts of rule on an international um, legal and political level which are properly called contexts of rule and therefore justice as a term banishing arbitrary rule applies. So to make an argument that justice applies in trans to transnational, international or supranational relations, we do not have to make the argument that we already live in a world which has a basic structure, globally speaking, comparable to what Rawls thought a basic structure is. That is a competition that we cannot win that cosmopolitans cannot win. You can make a number of very plausible arguments, like Cohen Sable and many others make, that there is a dense institutional network, globally speaking. But if you compare it to the network within a society like this one, or the one I come from, uh, that doesn't, you know, that comparison doesn't hold. So that competition cannot be won, but it need not be won. It is sufficient to say that beyond and across states and between states, there are so many forms of rule and domination, which some are weaker, some actually have more severe consequences, maybe, than those within a state. You just have to have a differentiated vocabulary to identify these relations of domination. To say either state or not doesn't, doesn't help here. Um, to say they have to be institutional and legal doesn't help too, because some of these forms of domination are quite informal. They work through economic agreements, which not all of them are, have a clear legal structure. Uh, not all of them, for not all of them is clear where the legal authority actually lies if something goes wrong. So this is um, the picture, the much more complex picture that we have to we have to look at. Um, since I'm a, I'm a Frankfurter, the critique of positivism has to come in at some point, and so here, I, here it comes. I think uh, in the current literature, um, those who argue that a context of justice only exists where there is a tight, positive network of cooperation, of mutual cooperation, um, as well as those who argue that a context of justice only exists where there is a legal authority properly institutionalized, uh, are, two, are two forms of positivism. The one I call positive cooperationalist positivism because they only look at positive forms of cooperation and thus overlook negative forms of cooperation, enforced cooperation, 
those where there is not much willingness to engage in a form of cooperation, but you nevertheless must, uh, or are, you know, most, most, you'd rather not be, uh, and you know you're screwed, uh, excuse me, you're uh, exploited, and, um, and, uh, but you still have no choice uh, but to engage uh, in it. This is negative cooperation, and if you only focus on positive cooperation, that falls out of the picture. Such as um, my dear friend Andrea Zandrumani thinks that a context of justice has to be a context of cooperation in that positive sense. And so re a justice theorist reconstructs the internal values and ideas of such contexts, like the EU. That's fine. Not so sure what the positive value reconstructed of the EU at the moment is, but even historically you could make a lot of cases that it was about peace and not so much about justice, it was about the production of wealth and not so much about distributive justice and so on. So, the, but these are interesting things, but if you want to know what the normative order, what the relevance of the normative order of Europe is with respect to justice, um, um, it's also the, the, the forms of domination that you, you, within Europe, across Europe, and beyond Europe are present. So the people uh, on the other side of the border of the EU are part of that normative order if they are dominated um, uh, by um, that order, at least uh, to, some, um, to some extent. The other positivism I call positive institutionalism. You think that only where a proper legal authority is institutionalized, the term justice applies. But then all the less perfect forms of legal uh, and political order where people are um, subjected to certain power relations are not part of your picture. You have no justice language uh, for them and so you only have the language of, of aid, of uh, assistance and so on. And I think that is a problem. Justice is a relational virtue. It applies to those relations of rule, where we have a demand of justification, um, and these can be formal or informal, and it applies to relations of domination, where there is no justification, and where institutions of justifications, justification are lacking, and these can be relations within, or beyond, or between states. And it's interesting that when we look at schemes of transnational domination, if that's what we then look at, if we want to analyze what the scheme of domination is uh, that brings shirts like this into shops uh, around here, um, which are produced in Bangladesh by some poorly paid people, um, and, and you try to reconstruct the structures of domination along that production line, uh, that's a quite fascinating uh, thing to do because you see that uh, how many different agents how many different legal orders, uh, economic um, um, relations play a role here. But if we, if we had a conception of justice that couldn't be realistically applied to and start from such, no, such structures of domination, I think justice would be not properly located. We would just, we would just speak about something uh, such as, you know, a sufficientarian view of people having enough to eat and having uh, sufficient goods at their disposal worldwide, which is a great thing. But if, we, if we're interested in a conception of transnational justice, uh, we need to find a grammar or in the language. Normative as well as analytic, scientific, social scientific for these uh, relations of um, of domination. So for me, a realistic conception of transnational justice isn't one which thinks, as many realists in political science, that states have all the power and what we have to look at are the way states deal with each other. Yeah, that's a form of realism, uh, classical realism. But the true critical realism is to look at the forms of domination these states are part of as dominators and dominated and they are dominated not only by other states, they are also dominated by other powerful agents.
um, or parts of a state is dominated by powerful agents, which are not, not necessarily uh, the agents of that state. So you get a, a realistic picture is much more complex than uh, that of some realists who, who are interested in uh, state sovereignty um, and states as a main locus, the main locus of power. So when we think about transnational justice, I don't think we need to, uh, to, uh, to have a clear view of what an original position of all human beings worldwide would come up with in terms of an institutional idea of a federal society, of societies, or a world state, or whatever. Uh, these are very interesting thought experiments, but if you relocate justice in the proper way, as an anti-domination virtue, you have to start from an analysis of the domination that exists. Um, so my idea, again, is that justice isn't something we collectively think of what a just society would be. Rather, it's a more negative approach. Uh, justice comes to correct the um, structures of domination that already, um, that already exist. So a transnational basic structure of justification seems to be a demand of that theory, and it is, but at the same time very complicated, because since I said <coughs> that states are not the main and only agents in um, a realistic conception um, um, and, and analysis of domination, so who do we start with? All people? But not all people are equally subject of transnational rule and domination. Um, I think we should start with states as the main agents of a structure of justification. Uh, that, so, and, and then work, um, uh, have some ideas about how weaker states can attain justificatory power to challenge stronger states. But at the same time, we have to think about this justificatory structure as a structure where states that do not properly represent their people or only a part of it, can be challenged by uh, opposition parties and dissenters who have to be part of that structure of justification. And at the same time, um, we need to make sure that those who are dominated in a global economic structure and for whom their state doesn't really speak because the state cooperates, whether willingly, freely, and happily or not most of the time, in a mixture, cooperates with economic uh, um, uh, forces, that uh, those who are the subject of such forms of domination, uh, they th say those in a, in, a, in a country like Brazil who work in the gold mines, rather than those who profit from the gold mines in a country like Brazil, um, these are um, groups that have to be um, have to participate in a discourse about transnational justice. But the starting point would be a structure of justification between states because only from there I think you can differentiate um, uh, and uh, think about other participants in such uh, structures. It also doesn't have to be one global structure of justification like a world parliament, so that's an interesting idea. It can be more regional structures of justification. So if, if in a certain region in which certain forms of exploitation and domination exist, um, um, those who are subject to it can generate sufficient justificatory power and exercise what I call the force toward the better argument. So it's not the force of the better argument, which is a counterfactual idea. In institutional settings, you need to have participants who generate sufficient justificatory power to make privileges visible, to force those who have the privileges to uh, justify them and to see, to make obvious that these justifications are just not there. Um, um, so, um, so structures of justification need not all be global, but they have to be effective enough to exercise the force towards the proper, uh, toward the better, the better argument. Now, final word about democracy. I'm sorry for going on for that long. Uh, first, I'll make you wait a long time, and then I'll speak. <laughs>
for ages, and now I'm almost over. Um, um, democracy, in this understanding, is the practice of justice, as I said. Uh, it is the practice that we need in structures of justification, where the force toward the better argument is exercised. But now you could say, oh, this is a very fluid conception of democracy. It, it's, it's, it's not quite sure who are the clearly demarcated participants, what is the setting, what are the powers that are being challenged. Um, and that is right. And the reason for that is that I think democracy is essentially a fluid con con concept. Uh, it's always a concept of democratization. It's, it's always about recuperating normative power of those who are subject to rule or domination to become normative authorities to uh, question these forms of domination and to co-determine the normative order they are part of. I think in societies as we know them, that's how democracy works if it does work. It is about people who do not have sufficient social and political normative power to co-determine their society, trying to generate more power through rights, through the use of uh, these on that means, people who, do, who have either no voting rights or whose voting rights are such that they cannot use them, uh, people who, if they have voting rights, are facing a political system which makes these rights rather ineffective because of the way political power works, is reproduced, is funded, is connected to money, and so on. If you think of all this, think of democracy as a form of democratization. It's the same thing of, well, not quite the same thing, but it's, not a, it's a difference of degree and not of kind to what we have to think of on the transnational level. It's challenging existing forms of power and domination and trying to recuperate some normative authority over them on the side of those who are subject to it. That's why I think we often use not just a reified conception of justice as a purely goods-oriented conception, but also a reified conception of democracy, as if we live in democratic societies where the struggle for democracy is pretty much over. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, it's not the case within our societies, it's not the case at the borders of our societies where, um, where people try uh, to get into um, uh, because they cannot live anymore in the countries um, that uh, are connected to us in an economic system that leaves them very few possibilities. They are part of our democracy, uh, but they have no normative standing within it. Therefore, democracy is as much a fighting creed as justice, which is what a critical theorist would have, would have to say. Um, but it is um, based on um, the normative, on a Kantian normative view, that the basic claim of justice is not to be subject to an order that is not justifiable to you. And so it is a critical theory that it's a, 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 on the one hand grounded in a critical view of current structures of, of domination, but at the same time um, is um, a foundational view, if you like, with respect to the principles of practical reason and the rights of human beings we start from. Thanks so much for your attention.